Hey you folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to another episode of Let's Play Kerbal Space Program. We are on our grand tour of Jewel. So this is the ship that we assembled to go to Jewel because we have a tourist who wants to do a flyby of every single moon of Jewel. He doesn't actually care about seeing Jewel itself. He just wants to do a, sh a very low... Uh, orbital pass of every single moon of, of Jewel. So this is my ship design. It's got one nuclear engine on there. A nuclear engine is very, very, very efficient, but it doesn't have a whole lot of thrust. And my ship was heavy, it had a lot of fuel. So these burns were taking an apocalyptically glacial amount of time. I think the, um, the initial burn to leave the sphere of influence of Kerbin was like 42 minutes, and most of it was gonna be burning on the wrong side of Kerbin, be awkward, so I ended up splitting it into a bunch of like four to six minute burns to raise my, my apoapsis slowly, and then finally I was able to find a gravity assist from the moon once my apple got high enough that I could potentially encounter it, and that's gonna save a lot of time and a little bit of fuel, but mostly at this point I was concerned about saving time because you can't fast forward the, the burns, right? They have to be done in real time. You could be able to do a physics acceleration, but this ship would just shake itself apart if I did that, so you never want to do that. So I had to do all these burns in real time, which is why this wasn't recorded sort of live, right? I recorded it while I was watching a lot of Netflix. In particular here, my uh, Hohmann transfer from the, um, the sort of general Kerbin orbit, right? I'm out of the sphere of influence of Kerbin, but I'm basically in the same orbit as Kerbin, to my Julian encounter. It was a burn that was lasting an hour and a half, an hour and a half of real time. So at this point, I'm definitely just sort of sitting, watching Netflix, monitoring my fuel tanks, getting ready to stage when a fuel tank is empty, just to boost my uh, my DV a little bit. You want to you want to ditch your empty tanks as soon as possible, get rid of that extra weight. Um, you know, plus it gives you a little bit more thrust effectively, but it's just a little bit more fuel efficient. I was concerned at this point about um, my ship being off balance. Clearly, the center of mass is not going to be in line with the center of thrust. Um, and I was I was considering you know keeping the tanks there and doing some manual rebalance. Um, then eventually, I decided to just go ahead and, and, you know, take a risk anyway. As it turns out, the thrust from my nuclear engine was so minimal that my reaction wheels were easily able to counter any uh, any misalignment between my center of thrust and center of weight at this point, so it's fine. Uh, you can see in one of those shots, I'm actually getting a little bit of overheat effects, just a scooch, even though I've got radiators. Uh, engines, of course, do generate heat as they burn. Usually your burns are quite short, but in this case, again, an hour and a half burn in real time. At this point, I've actually gone AFK. I went out for dinner. I, I made sure that um, I was here for most of all the staging that was needed. And then it was like, I can't remember, there was still like, you know, 45 minutes or so or whatever it was. And I was just like, okay, I'm AFK now. I'm just, I, I left. So here I'm, I'm gone. But uh, very, very soon I'm going to come back and take over. We've got most of an encounter there. I'm using the uh, maneuver planner from MechJeb and things to help with these uh, orbital transfer. Not using the like advanced transfer to the other planet or anything like that, but at least, you know, the home and transfer uh, eliminates a lot of frustration of, you know, planning your maneuver and then just sliding it around and around until, you know, you get the right orbit to get there. Um, Delta V at this point, we still have, what, about 7,300 Delta V uh, left in the tank. And we are on a Julian encounter. So I'd sort of earmarked um, something like my final tank, especially, right? My final tank, which has the uh, the 3,900 Delta V in it, that big central tank. Um, I was hoping that I'd finish all my flybys of the moons um, using all the external tanks that would jettison and then have everything in the central tank for returning home. That was sort of the eyeball budget. I didn't know exactly how much Delta V I'd need to re-encounter Kerbin and enter Kerbin orbit, which was important. I couldn't just do a flyby of Kerbin. I had to enter orbit. If I didn't manage to dock with the Ark Station again, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It's worth noting, again, my ship is not designed to re-enter. It has no parachutes, nothing like that, um, which would save a lot of Delta V because if you're just, you know, slowing yourselves down by smacking into the atmosphere, then you don't need fuel for that. But my goal was always to re-dock with uh, the Ark. Um, and at the very least, I had to make sure that I could um, re-enter orbit around Kerbin. Even if it was a high orbit, then I could, you know, run some sort of uh, tugboat or rescue mission or something. That that was all that mattered. So at this point, we've entered the sphere of influence of Jewel. Jewel and its four moons? I'm trying to remember. Four or five? Uh, Lathe, Pole, Bob, Val... I can't remember if there's four or five. Um, one of them, I think it's Bop, is on a really screwed up angle. I don't know if you'll be able to see it at some point over here if the video is going too fast or not. But that moon is on a really crazy inclination, not in line with everything else, which was certainly a pain. At this point, I was even worried, like, do I have enough thrust to enter orbit around Jewel? Um... And I did, because I was going to be sort of in this sphere of influence for several days. So that gave me lots of time to be able to burn retrograde to actually form an orbit. But you can see, like, it's taking a long time. That's another 20 plus minute burn just to stop me from going and just flying by Bool. 
and instead um, actually lock into an orbit. I don't know why I'm like canceling some of these maneuvers um, or, or whatnot. Here I'm not even burning retrograde at all. I, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I am. I'm at full burn, just facing retrograde. I guess I was just doing it manually because why not? Sure. A little bit of that. I think I'll reset them. Oh, it's because we're almost done. You can see here it's ready to close up. Uh, this is playing at, I think, four times speed? No, much faster than that. My rat bad. It's uh, running at... Um, about 20 times normal speed is what you're seeing here. So this is this was in incredibly slow. But I am about to close the orbit around Jewel. And then comes the tricky part. And I um, I didn't realize this at the time. It was quite quickly noticed once I started trying to figure out my intercepts. Is I'm actually orbiting around Jewel the wrong way. I'm orbiting around Jewel clockwise, where normally you would orbit around celestial bodies counterclockwise, which matches their natural rotation. Um, this added some difficulty in actually encountering the moons because the moons are orbiting the other direction. So we're doing head-on encounters, which means our actual encounter time is very brief, which makes it much harder to actually enter the sphere of influence. Um, it also, I think, adds some complexity to maybe using the moons to do various gravity assists, either gravity breaking or gravity uh, boosting. Um, on the other hand, Flying by the moon so quickly means I'm not actually spending a lot of time in the sphere of influence, and I have a very large relative acceleration, which means the moons don't actually affect my path very much. So there's pros and cons. Sometimes you want it to affect your path, and other times it might actually be fine that it doesn't. In the end, it was what it was. Um, I'm sure this could have been done like infinitely better. I didn't read any guides for doing anything like this. I was just eyeballing things, and I was like, once I got to the system, my plan was just like, all right, I'm going to try to start with the outermost moon and then just keep sort of, you know, effectively burning prograde relative to Joule as much as possible and keep dropping my orbit for another pass to the next moon and so on and so forth, knowing that each moon encounter was going to modify things a bit. But yeah, it's very tricky to actually modify my path to do the close flyby. I had to do like very, very fine maneuvers to bring it down. And again, that's a, a fact, a, a, a side effect of having these encounters in the opposite direction. But as I'm doing the encounters, I'm getting a lot of science. I have uh, eight science experiments here, including the material bay and the goo container, which I can reset because I've got a scientist. And actually, I don't even have to EVA the scientist because I've got a science lab. And the science lab has a nice convenient feature on it um, that if you right click on it, you can clean experiments, which is to say reset goo and material containers. So first thing I did is I transferred all the material into the science lab itself, which can hold uh, 500 data. And then I transmitted it back. And then once I hit the solid 500 data in the science lab, then I didn't have to worry about storing anything more. Uh, one thing, we're so far away from the sun at this point that my four giant solar panels are actually not enough to run the greenhouse and the, um, the research lab and also maintain the life support, which is like really too bad. Uh, the greenhouse is part of the Pioneer module. It only runs at like 25% efficiency, so it doesn't do that much for you anyway. But it did extend, especially on the trip out to Jewel, it did extend my food, water, and oxygen supplies by... Um, by a little bit, you know, just making it so that instead of burning, you know, one second worth of food every second, I was burning a second worth of food maybe every second and a half or something like that. So it stretched out my food supplies. In the end, I ended up with lots extra. So, you know, it wasn't strictly necessary, but it was nice to do. And in particular, the research was nice because on these long trips, I was able to transmit a bunch of science back home and get way more than just the actual science value by itself, especially since I'm not bringing anything back. The material study and goo things, I think I'm only transmitting for what, 30% of its actual science? but um, as opposed to, you know, 100% if I brought the module back. But this way I could reuse the same modules over and over. And again, I don't plan on landing this ship back on Kerbin. It's going to stay in orbit around Kerbin forever. Um, it's, I'm going to have to ship up a new engine component, right? But um, the front part can definitely be reused. Just restock all the uh, life support modules and then go to town. So at this point, um, I think I'm at the closest moon. It's kind of hard. Like you have to be at different zoom levels to spot all the moons, but I think we're there. Is that, is that, am I around Lathe right now? I guess we can look on the left-hand side. Lathe is done, or I mean, I need to do, oh no, there's another one in there. My, my, my screen, it's a little small. It looks like I haven't encountered Vale, Lathe, or, um, or Bop. There we go. So that we have to still do that, and we're working at it. Lathe is cool. Lathe is, has water and an atmosphere. Um, apparently, it's not breathable, uh, if I understand the wiki properly. People still need a helmet and some life support and things like that. But there is an atmosphere. You can get planes that run on there. Um, you can aerobrake, which is really great. Obviously, you can't land on Jewel. Jewel is a gas giant, so you don't want to do that. Although, I think you could still aerobrake on Jewel if you are trying to enter the system, which is nice. You just clip the top edge of the atmosphere. Not enough to slow yourself down where you're going to land on the planet, because you can't. You don't want to do that. But just clip it enough to help you slow down so you need less fuel, which is pretty cool. 
So here I am again, you know, just planning these maneuvers and it's mostly just brute force. It's like, okay, here I am now. Let's put a maneuver out and see what we can encounter. I still have 4,500 Delta V at this point um, and I only have two encounters left, but I was concerned because again, my plan was ideally my big central tank was gonna be used entirely for a return. And I only have 500 Delta V left in my last side tank. And I have to encounter the very awkward moon that's at a wonky inclination. And inclination changes, plane changes can be very expensive, especially since I'm not really able to gravity assist around these moons too much. Like normally the idea might be to just burn a little um, normal or anti-normal when passing by a moon. So you go slightly above or below the equator, which then sort of slingshots you around at even more dramatic angle, which can help you do these encounters. And here my inclination like totally doesn't match, right? I'm nowhere near lined up the, the orbital inclination of, of BOP. Um, and so I'm coming at it completely sideways, which makes it very, very, very hard to encounter because there's just the one tiny part in the orbit where I'm going to clip past that, uh, that moon, as opposed to when you come aligned, then, you know, you can just fly side by side and there's a lot more space there for you to do your encounter. So this was a very difficult one. And I, a big part of me at this point had considered like, um, scrubbing the mission. Like I would not finish the contract. I would still generate a whole bunch of science, which is good because I need um, I need the science for more engines and more life support options and more science options, right? So that it can keep going forward. So the, the mission still would have done something. I still would have gotten a lot of science out of this trip, but I wouldn't have completed the contract. In particular, the contract is gonna give me 5 million bucks, which is gonna more than pay for this mission. Total cost of this mission um, is probably somewhere at around three quarters of a million. Uh, maybe not that much. I know the engine module uh, was a half a million to, to launch. Um, so that was the ascent stage, but also the engine module itself. That was a half a million. It was very expensive and full of a lot of fuel. I don't think the top stage is as expensive, although it's still relatively heavy to launch. So it wouldn't surprise me if it was a quarter of a million dollar ship. I'll have to go and look in the, um, uh, the VAB at some point and see what the cost of that is. But I bet you the cost of the whole mission was about three quarters of a million. And that doesn't include my, the ARC space station around Kerbin, which I used for some of the docking and setup, although it has its own value there. So, um, yeah, so there's definitely some cost and I would want that 5 million to recoup it. Plus, I do ideally want to, oh yeah, here I'm being told that there's the, the my ARC was running out of food and water and stuff. And I was like, what? And I didn't realize that the, uh, the TAC life support sort of doesn't process those things if you're not at the ship. Um, but as soon as you switch to the ship, it knows how long it's been running and it sort of like processes that backlog. So I instantly went from like, under 100 food, water, and oxygen to, boom, you have 850 days of food, water, and oxygen, you're fine. So I was like, oh, okay. So you just switch to the other thing whenever you get a warning and then it replenishes itself and it's fine. But we're done, we're done, Jewel. We have actually successfully done the flyby of every single moon and we still have 3,500 Delta V. Basically we had that whole central tank left in terms of Delta V, but, um, and I, I was talking about something else at the time. I did use a gravity assist to help me leave Jewel, but I got my right and left hand side confused. You're supposed to sort of gravity assist and you want to leave towards the right hand side of the sphere of influence of Jewel, assuming Jewel is at the 12 o'clock in the solar system. Um, basically, so that way you're leaving in a retrograde direction, which helps you lower your orbit towards Kerbin. Uh, I goofed up. I got my left and right confused. Maybe my camera was pointing the wrong, wrong way at the time. And I left in a prograde direction. So I boosted into a higher orbit, which means both it will take me longer to get back to Kerbin, but also use more fuel. As it turns out, I still have lots of food, water, and oxygen. I have 2,000 days remaining, and I think my re-encounter of Kerbin at this point is a little over a year away. So I have plenty left in the bank. Um, plenty, plenty, plenty. You can see the food, water, and oxygen dropping. Maybe it was a little more than a year. Maybe it was like a year and a half or something crazy like that to come back to Kerbin. Those were fine, but I did end up using more Delta V. I'm down, I'm still burning right now. Um, but there we go. It, uh, we have 2,300 Delta V right now, which seems like a lot, but re-entering orbit of Kerbin, as opposed to just flying by Kerbin, is gonna require a massive retrograde burn. And also don't necessarily know where the sweet spot is. I mean, I guess ideally you do it at the, at the Perry. Um, and I don't remember, I guess I mostly do that. But because my burns are so long and slow as well, it means it's not optimal. Ideally, you do the entire Delta V change at exactly the periapsis with an infinite thrust engine. Well, I don't, I have a very low thrust engine, which means I'm gonna be burning quite a bit before and after the periapsis to try to make it work. Um, and as a result, um, 
And yeah, I'm slight, just below 2300 Delta V here. And I'm still making a couple of adjustments. I'm trying to bring my course to be as close as possible to Kerbin as possible. So I have the lowest periapsis, which increases the efficiency. And here you can see this burn to get back into orbit. About 1300 gets me into a relatively low Kerbin orbit, which is great. Again, it's a long burn. It looks like about 13 minutes at this point when I'm staring at it. Um, it does mean I'm not doing the burn that close to the peri, which is slightly less efficient, but not too bad. But all I care about at this point is, okay, I'm in orbit of Kerbin. I'm not going to just fly by the planet and then go smack into the sun or leave the solar system or something like that. So no matter what, I can be rescued. Ideally, at this point, I would like to then drop my orbit to so that I can encounter the space station, the ARC space station, which is an orbit at 200 kilometers around Kerbin. Will I have enough Delta V to do that? Let's find out. Oh, look at the heat. All my stuff is getting super, super, super hot over here. Um, these are such long burns, and I don't have that many radiators. Next time, I'll bring the ones that expand out, but we're okay. And I'm having to, again, split my burn into multiple burns, and then I, I notice my inclination is off. I think this is the first time I noticed my inclination was bad, which is not good, because you want to do plane corrections as far for, uh, out as possible because here it takes a lot more delta v to change and you can see in fact this maneuver here is taking all my fuel left i'm going to be left with basically no fuel left in the tank um i will be and this is quite helpful i will be in a perfect zero inclination orbit which will make rendezvous with a tugboat much 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 better much better uh, so that was important. I'm like, listen, I'll, I'll drop my orbit as much as possible so that the tug doesn't need that much fuel to reach me and also to fix me. And I want to be in a uh, equatorial orbit to fix that. And here we go. This is this is my tug. This is my tugboat right over here. It's uh, it's very simple. I um I actually uh, goofed because in hindsight, what I should have done is at the same time with this tugboat is actually send up my um uh, my lander module. Because I got to bring my tourists back home, and right now I have nothing that can land it. On the other hand, you know this kept the tugboat relatively cheap and easy to build, so it gets up into space. Um, I make sure that we are tangential on one side of the orbit over there, and then the other just gets adjusted for the the meetup, which happens there. I can't remember. I may have used some of the MechJeb tools to assist on this. I can't recall. And then we get to do a docking. And let me tell you, after docking all the space station modules, which are insanely heavy um, and and insanely slow to rotate, this was a dream. It was so nice to do a docking with a nice, agile ship again. It was just like, ah, uh, just gorgeous and glorious and so convenient to do that. Um, when you are at the Space Center, you got to look at how much science I've got from time to time. Oh, I think I had to switch back to the Space Center there because it wasn't giving me the opportunity to make maneuver nodes on my orbit, which happens sometimes. We're going to the Space Center and coming back. We'll fix it. And there we go. We are planning our, our transfer to the actual space station right over here. Bit of a tweak of orbit, close encounter. It's a little more difficult to maneuver now because I've got more weight, uh, but it's not too bad and I actually have a decent amount of RCS. And my actual deep space ship had its own RCS as well. And... Um, I should have at this point, and I, don't, I haven't, I'm not sure why, I should have ditched, see, I shouldn't have done that. What I should have done is ditch the engine module from Deep Space Explorer because it's empty and quite heavy. And in fact, I should have kept the docking module here because it has a lot more RCS um, thrusters and stuff. But this worked out okay, so we moved parallel. I still have, um, I only had like 50 units of monopropellant. And that was fine. Despite this big, heavy ship, that is more than enough. Uh, you just sort of align yourself to face the docking port. You go sideways until you encounter it. Dock. There we go. And we're going to bring this video to an end. And in the next video, we're going to be back in real-time recording. Thanks for watching, folks. See you next time. Bye-bye.